because this afternoon I'm going to talk about, I haven't got a script. I usually work from notes. I'm not working from notes. I'm working from a couple of bullet points I'll put up for myself. And I'm just going to be talking about stuff that's interested me and fascinated me over the years, all to do with the reptilian complex and the early brain, which I've worked with for a long time. Uh, and I won't pretend it's anything to do with scientific research, so you don't need to try and look me up to debunk it. I don't mind if somebody does debunk it. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a brain scientist. I'm not a neurologist. I am just Terence Watts. That's me. And I've done loads of work over the years and loads of work with clients. So this is all based on my work with clients since 1989. That's over 35,000 client hours. And dear goodness knows how many teaching hours <clears throat> I've done. How many thousands of people I've worked with, I really don't know. Uh, and that's what it's all based on. But I have to say, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is hypothesis. I can't prove and don't intend to try to prove a lot of what I'm talking about. It's true to my satisfaction. Uh, some of it you'll have heard of, if you, especially if you've done BWRT. Um, if you've not been done BWRT, a lot of it will be new to you. Even if you have done it, some of it's going to be new to you. And... I'm planning to talk a bit about the lizard brain and how it works with belief and expectation. Trauma and PTSD. Oh, I, I love talking about trauma and PTSD because there's a few rubbish ideas around with that, not mentioning any names, but there are. Um, manifestation, what it really is, there's a few rubbish ideas about that as well. Um, just my opinion, of course. Uh, manifestation, what it really is and how we can make it work. Ancestral influence, why so many people feel unlovable. And what can be done about it? And psychic ability and spirituality are very, very sort of uh, awkward area to work in because I'm inclined to alienate people sometimes, and I don't mind that either. I have my own ideas. I'm not purely spiritual. I'm not purely logical. Those of you who know me know how I function. And so I'm hoping to talk about those things. I have not a clue how long it will take. This Today's talk will last anything between 30 minutes and 60 minutes, but I promise I'll quit after 60 minutes anyway. And I'll try and answer any questions, as I say, as I go. But as I say, it's all mainly a hypothesis. I can't promise it's got scientific research from it. I can promise you it's got empirical experience behind it. And the things I'm going to be talking about have been tested many, many times to my own satisfaction. But it is nonetheless a hypothesis, not a scientific fact or proof or anything of the sort. So often called the reptilian complex. Uh, I'm really going to talk about it as the lizard brain today because that's the name by which it's more frequently known by many, many people. And the lizard brain is involved in far more than you might realise. It's instrumental in those processes I've talked about. It's instrumental in manifestation. It's instrumental in all forms of success, in PTSD, panic attacks, anxiety, of all, it, all its various forms. Maybe even psychic ability and spirituality, which sounds a bit odd. <clears throat> Some of you will know, I wrote a paper called uh, Reptilian, the Reptilian Complex Gateway to the Soul. I had a question mark on them, but I believe that it is a gateway to what we refer to as soul. And there's a very it's strange thing the reptilian complex does, the lizard brain does, because it's a very simple bit of kit. It's not at all complicated like many people believe. Some of you already know this. So if you've done BWRT, a lot of what I'm talking about at the beginning here, you're familiar with. So it might even be slightly boring to you, but uh, some of you don't know anything about it at all. And it would be an incomplete talk if I didn't cover basics of it. So it's the oldest part of the brain. Uh, and that the lizard brain goes back literally to the time when there were mostly lizards on the planet, reptiles. It goes back, some people say 650 million years, other people say 550 million years. So what's 100 million years <laughs> between friends? Somewhere between 550 and 650 million years ago is where the lizard brain came into being. Before that, there was no creature as far as anybody has been able to establish with any form of brain at all. But at that point... The brain evolves. Um, and at that point there, you've got a, a, a creature with, with a process which is different from just purely instinctive reactions. It does something slightly different. To survive, those early creatures had to be able to act, not think. Thinking is very slow. In those early days when there were a lot of predators about, if you were, I don't know, a creature that was going to get eaten by a crocodile, what you couldn't do is stop and say, hang on, that looks like a crocodile. I think I'd better run away. It had to be action. That was the most important part of it. It's the oldest uh, part of the brain. Every single event 
had to be processed by it. No matter where, where it came in, whether it came in by the olfactory organ, so somebody could smell something, hear something, see something, feel something, whatever, it all had to be processed by the lizard brain because it was the only brain that those animals had. There isn't another part of the brain. They didn't have any other secret parts. That was it. Uh, it didn't have any self-awareness as far as anybody knows. There was no uh, awareness of self. There was no theory of mind, nothing of that sort. A very basic survival mechanism. It's designed to work very fast. It's got more neurons than every other part of the brain put together. Now, research is still going on for that because when I first started teaching this stuff, I used to say that the brain has 100 billion neurons because that's what everybody said. And I didn't count them myself, but everybody said 100 billion. But that's been revised because somebody did count them instead of estimating them to 85 billion, still a hell of a lot an almost infinite number of connections because the connections don't remain, the connections shift and shift all those. So there's trillions and trillions of possible types of connection. But the bit we're really interested in is that lizard brain, the earliest part of the brain, includes the cerebellum. The neurons there are granular. They don't have a, a nerve body and, and dendritic threads and so on. They are granular. They're all compressed close together. They have 80% of the brain's neurons, 80% are in the cerebellum, which is about 1 15th of the size of the brain. So 80% of the neurons are there. I found that totally fascinating when I discovered it. Uh, I believe that is a scientific fact, by the way. When you're born, you have two reflexes. One is to loud noises, and the other one is to falling. Apparently, that's all that exists. But any second you're born, you start assessing life and storing patterns from the very moment you're born. The, the brain starts to store patterns of behavior and the reaction to them. Now, originally, the, it was believed that the cerebellum was only concerned with stopping you falling over and coordinating movement, so that you actually, if you reached out to touch something, your hand actually went to what it was. Uh, that was the old belief. But more recent research, maybe five or six years ago, indicated that the cerebellum does a whole lot more than that. It's got a whole lot of what could even be compared to computer modules lined up side by side, connecting to every single part of the brain. So as I've been teaching for many, many years now, it's absolutely fair to say that everything in the psyche, wherever it is and wherever it resides, is connected to absolutely everything else in the psyche, wherever it is and wherever it resides, via the cerebellum. It's the ultimate survival toolkit. If an action results in survival, repeat it. It's as simple as that. Now, evolution doesn't upgrade anything. It just modifies it. I say it doesn't upgrade it. It, it doesn't actually suddenly decide it's going to transfer a process to another part of the brain. So that reptilian complex, that lizard brain, is still the first responder. Another example of that is that the hammer, anvil, and stirrup bones in your ear, they used to be part of the jaw of reptiles. And they involved into the air bones in mammals. So the lizard brain was always the first responder. And it probably still is. It might even be what we often call subconscious because there is no awareness there. So that lizard brain might even be what is often called the subconscious. We don't know what it's doing until it's done it, even though that might not be what we think we want to do. It doesn't matter what we think we want to do because the lizard brain has already made a decision. There's no free will in the way we usually think of it. And this is a, a sort of concept that many people have argued with over the years. And they've said, well, I can just simply change my mind. Just yes, you can. But how do you decide to change your mind? The decision to change your mind was probably made before you knew you wanted to change your mind. So there's no free will in the way we usually think of it. We do have free will. We, we can stop an action, as you know. If you're driving and your foot moves towards the brake pedal because you see something move, but then you decided it was just a paper bag, you stop the action. So that's free wound. <clears throat> but you can't stop the action in the first place or the urge for the action. And all of this comes, of course, from the experiments of Benjamin Libet in the 80s, 1980s, when he proved to his satisfaction that nobody had free will in the way they thought of it. It's been challenged many, many times. He found a third of a second gap, uh, up to a half a second gap between stimulus and response. Um, many, many people decried it, ridiculed him because they couldn't bear the notion they didn't have free will. And even now, there are still people that try to ridicule. This is 
one of the best forms of attack, isn't it, to ridicule something if you don't believe it? And this is what happens so frequently. And people still try to ridicule Libet and Libet's ideas and anybody who teaches them. But later research found a gap of up to seven seconds, which I found at first a bit unlikely. Until I was walking up the local high street about three years ago, uh, and I realized that I started moving out of somebody's way a long time before they were near to me. Coming in my direction, you've all done it. Somebody coming towards you, you automatically start moving. And if they move in the same direction you move, you don't really necessarily realize you do it unless you start to look for these things, which, of course, once I'd cottoned on to what I was doing with the lizard brain, I started researching as much of it as I could. And so that seven second gap is quite possibly something that we do without knowing we do it. Now, if people had true free will, they could just decide to not be anxious, to not be dependent, to not be depressed or anything else. Nearly all of you on here will have been at some point in a, in a kind of dependent relationship or relationship where you feel that you've, it's outsold its sell by date, if you like, but you nonetheless, you just don't feel able because you feel that the other party is dependent on you or you are in some way dependent on them. But if you had true free will, you could just decide to do it because it's what you really want to do, but something stops you. Depression is the worst one for that because that comes from a, a lack of drive and you can't just switch it on. People, if we had true free will, could decide not to react to criticism or bullying. And very few people can make that decision to not react. You have to do a mind switch. Uh, when you're at the top end of anything, you get quite a bit of criticism and bullying and you have to be able to be, if not immune to it, to shrug it off. I don't do that that well all the time, but I usually manage it. It takes a bit of time. So if I had true free will, I could just decide I wasn't going to react. I wasn't even going to think about it. It's so obvious that we don't have free will in the way we like to think of it. Uh, even when you say to people, you know, if I throw, if I lob something towards you, you'll try and catch it. If I throw something at you, I'll try to duck it. You all know these things. If you've done BWRT, you know all these things. Uh, and it's very, very evident that when you try to catch something that you've dropped, you don't think, oh, well, that's on its way down to the floor. I better stick my other hand out and try to catch it. That would be like half an hour too late. So you do this without any thought at all. You can't choose your thoughts. Even the things we think we decide just arrive in our thoughts from that first response. You can't choose your thoughts, only what to think about. <clears throat> Nor can you decide to stop thinking a particular thing. You can't just choose to be or not to be anything, in fact. Wouldn't it be wonderful to switch off jealousy, hurt, anger, and so on? You just can't do it because it arrives in your brain. It's All these things are primeval responses. By the time you're aware of them, they've been triggered. They don't exist in that lizard brain they're triggered by the lizard brain even what passes for spirituality whatever it is and i don't know what it is i'm going to talk about it later even spirituality is governed by this part of the brain some people are highly spiritual and highly uh, receptive and sensitive i don't know what that is i just know that some people are highly receptive and highly sensitive i am aware that sometimes when i'm one of these online sessions I can suddenly catch a feeling of what somebody, and it'll be an, I'll, I'll name a person sometimes. I'm not going to do that today because it'd be embarrassing. But I'll, I can feel right now a few of you reacting to what I'm saying and a few of you actually feeling what I'm saying because I'm catching that feeling back. Now, this sounds a bit woo-woo if you're not connected anywhere at all. And I'm quite a logical person, as you know. But nonetheless, I don't think that the awareness of whatever that form, whatever that is, whether it's psychic connection or spirituality, whatever it is, I don't think that means that logic isn't right. I don't think that logic means that spirituality isn't right. They're just two entirely separate issues. So all of that part of the brain was all totally unconscious. Now awareness, the sense of self, the theory of mind and logic, all that evolved after the rest of the brain was established is new. We don't know where awareness resides in the brain. We don't know where our sense of self resides in the brain. Nobody knows, uh, if it, even if it lives in the brain at all. It's referred to in physics as the hard problem, and it irritates physicians because, uh, uh, um, sorry, physical scientists, it irritates them because um, they can't actually define what it is 
people try to work out why consciousness and the theory of mind, aware of other people, aware of ourselves, why it has evolved. Uh, did it just evolve or did it have a purpose? And where does it live anyway? Memories aren't stored in the brain. That's another irritant for people. Memories are recreated each time you think of them. But you can't choose what to recreate. I hope this is making sense to everybody. You can't actually choose what to recreate. You cannot switch that bit of brain off. I can make you think of something without any effort at all. Big toe, right big toe. You've now all thought you're right big toe. You didn't decide to think it. You didn't combat it. You didn't know what I was going to say. If you knew what I was going to say next, you could combat that, but you can't because you don't know what I'm going to say next. I'm going to mention a part of the body. Your mind now might be scanning through. You might get very, very lucky. But on the other hand, you might not. But as soon as I mention it, your mind will be doing it. The right elbow, the point of your right elbow, the absolute point. Again, you could not not think of it because all of that is controlled and governed by the little brain. That's how powerful it is. It's doing that the whole time. It's looking at the whole world. It's assessing every micro event that comes in, millions of events every, every split second. It's assessing them all and it's creating a response, most of which you don't notice. But uh, most most of it just passes by. But nonetheless, when you think of something, when you are aware of it, you didn't choose to think of it. It just visits itself upon you. So therefore, when people have different ideas from you, and I've been involved in a bit of conversation with somebody today, which and yesterday, which is quite interesting, who has polarized ideas for me, completely different. Um, and I just find it interesting. He didn't choose his ideas. I didn't choose mine but they're entirely up. Some of you might know who I'm talking about. There's no intent to insult anybody because I don't do that. I don't call anybody names. I don't do any mocking because I am very, very aware that we cannot choose what we think. We can choose what to do with what we think. So I'm not saying nobody you know, should be responsible for what they say or do. We can choose what to do with what we think, but what comes into your mind, you can choose what to think about, but you cannot choose exactly what your thoughts are. You can't choose what to think about what I'm saying here. You're forming an opinion, but you didn't actually think about, okay, what should I do with this? It was just there. This is I'm onto stuff here because I'm not working from notes. I've just got prompts here for me um, because I'm working from prompts. I'm talking about stuff about which I am wildly enthusiastic and tend to get very deeply involved with. And so I may not even see a question. So if I miss a question, please ask it again. Uh, I do to keep, try to keep an eye on the chat box as well, though. So something of enormous importance is that whatever conscious feedback, and conscious feedback to that reptilian complex, that lizard brain, conscious feedback is always an emotional response. I like it, I don't like it, it hurts, it doesn't hurt, whatever. So whatever emotional feedback, emotional response you give back to the lizard brain, it will act upon even when you're not thinking about it. On you. Uh, Lisa? Oh, okay, yes, Lisa, good question, thank you. Memories are not stored. What's stored are the triggers for memories. So if you're talking to person A and you're remembering a film you saw, you'll remember different parts of it than if you're talking to person B because it's triggered by, the brain is triggered by what's going on in the current state. So you're recalling something you saw before but you won't recall the same thing every time. Memories are variable. If memories are stored, it would always be identical every time, but it isn't. So although scientists often say they discover where memories are stored in the brain, what they mean is, is they've discovered the synaptic gaps and the synaptic processes that are triggered when a memory is recalled. But a memory is recalled and recreated by the processes of the lizard brain. This has been quite well established some time back. Nobody knows exactly how the lizard brain stores all those, but it has got 80% of the brain's neurons in it. And it seems to store every single pattern we've ever encountered. But nonetheless, when you think you're remembering something, it will always be slightly different according to who you're talking to. If you're remembering something now, it will be related to the words I'm saying, to the way I look, to the fact that it's online and so on. But it won't be an accurate memory. It will be a recreation of the elements that are present at this current moment. And that's what a memory is. A memory is something which, the wherever you are at the moment, if I say to somebody, can you remember your 10th birthday, you'll think of it. But it's also compared with now. Is this Does that make sense, Lisa? I hope it does, because that's about the best I can give on it. OK, got it. Good. Excellent. Um, and it's a very important uh, uh, facet of the way our brain works that we actually can't, uh, we don't store memories. So 
the feedback that you give the lizard brain in response to anything that happens, which to the emotional responses, uh, it, it'll backfire on you, even when you're not thinking about it, as I said just now. It's why bad ideas can so easily backfire on you. If you wish somebody hadn't got something that you want, you see that somebody's got something you really would like, and it's made you jealous, and you really wish you wouldn't have it, hadn't, they wish they hadn't got it, that's a negative influence, and that'll work against you. While wishing you had it as well, is a positive and will work for you. This is so important, I want to say again, because I have got this bit written out because it was important. Wishing somebody hadn't got something that you want is a negative influence and will work against you. You'll think about not having it. The brain is simple. If you think about not having it, it'll think about you not having it. Wishing you had it as well is a positive idea and will work for you. Now, when we understand this fully, it can genuinely make huge, huge changes for you. But to get the best out of it, you've got to do a complete U-turn on a common idea. The brain is the most complicated thing in this universe. We read that over and again, and it is, but it's only physically. And at a basic level, it's incredibly simple. And once you get that, you can make big changes. Essentially, it's the brain does one of three things. It's safe. It's unsafe. Wait a minute for more information. It's as simple as that. So the lizard brain is all about survival. Uh, and so when that part of the brain generates response to unsafe, that impulse must be discharged. Now, I'm going to talk more about this in a minute because it's vitally important. Once an idea, you, you may well have heard the expression, I think it's Freud, and once an idea has been accepted by subconscious, must be discharged in motor action. That's an old concept. It's, it's quite accurate. It appears to be the case that when an impulse is not discharged, it still stays primed and ready to go. Uh, I'm going to sound sexist now. Females tend to, perhaps because they suffer more frustration or they're more imaginative or whatever, but a female remembers something that wasn't discharged much more strongly than most males, most of the time. And that's why in an argument, uh, a female is more likely to say, and another thing, I remember when you whatever, whatever. Uh, and because brain, whatever anybody says, male and female minds do work slightly differently. And it's, I'm not, uh, I'm, the idea of female brain and male brain was debunked some time ago, but nonetheless, there are differences in thought processes. <clears throat> and so when an impulse is not discharged, it still stays primed and ready to go. But that causes symptoms such as readiness to anger or violence. The original trigger has been forgotten and probably doesn't even exist anymore. But this part of the brain doesn't know about that. The impulse was created and must be discharged. And if it, must, if it isn't discharged, that part of the brain, which doesn't do time at all, will believe there is still a risk. Now, this is really um, to do with trauma and PTSD. And this is why PTSD even exists. Now, it's often said that the body keeps the score, something with which I disagree totally. Uh, I know that's challenging because I know there's a very erudite, highly qualified person who's much more qualified than I am that states that the body keeps the store. I think they're wrong. It's actually the lizard brain that's created an impulse design for survival that hasn't been discharged. Every time it's fired up by something similar, it's only going to be remotely similar, the physical body will get precisely the same responses as it had in the first place. Physical anger, maybe. Nausea, perhaps. And how on earth can you sleep? When your survival kit believes your survivor is at risk because the urge to act hadn't been discharged. Now, a, I'm going to give a, a short segment of a talk I did for the Psychological Society of South Africa in 2019. Uh, I know some of you will have already heard it, but um, it's really apposite what I'm talking about. Because this will illustrate why I believe that it's not the body doesn't keep the score at all. It's the brain. A key factor is that we can only be consciously aware of one thing at a time. So while the individual is focused upon the traumatic situation and their response to it, the threat still exists and the lizard brain continues to trigger further response patterns. This continual triggering of responses also happens later on when the individual seems unable to stop dwelling on the event after it's over. And this is where the problem arises. An instinctive response must be acted upon to discharge it. And when it's not discharged, it remains there as a kind of pseudo instinct that responds to any stimuli that in some way echoes a part of the original pattern associated with the trauma. Then it becomes active, maybe violently so, 
creating with it a vivid recall of the part of the event where it was created. And we call that process a PTSD flashback. But it's a reminder of just a part of the original trauma, not of the whole thing. The pattern is incomplete. And because of this, the response can't achieve its original purpose, which was to remove the organism from danger. This bit of the brain is still trying to do that thing, trying to get you out of danger. So as far as that lizard brain is concerned, uh, I'll come to that in a minute, Cornell. So as far as that lizard brain is concerned, because of that lack of awareness of the passage of time, the threat still exists. Danger is still present. It's a simple but totally effective survival act, a tactic. An instinctive response will only be created if it's needed. And if it's needed and not acted upon, then the organism is at risk. This is just the lizard brain at work. The result is that whenever the tiniest thing that parallels some part of the original event occurs, the full response will be re-triggered. It often includes one of the most common of PTSD responses, anger, which is directly associated with survival. Anger is a 600 million year old fundamental aggression response to fear. And it's driven by that lizard brain recognizing an unsafe pattern. It's an oddity that during the trauma itself, anger might not be acted upon or even noticed if the, if the focus was on fl uh, flight rather than fight. This can lead to apparently irrational and over the top outbursts. Yeah, I, I'm going to come to those. So I can see your question. I'm coming to those in a minute, I promise. So um, this storage, if you like, can lead to apparently irrational and over-the-top outbursts. Somebody screams with anger at a minor transgression. An individual collapses in tears when somebody raises their voice a little. A driver is triggered into a violent road rage attack when somebody overtakes them on the wrong side. Point out, of course, the energy associated with the response to whatever is happening now is added to the energy of the undischarged instinct that's been waiting in the lizard brain for the opportunity to ensure the safety of the individual. That the current event is minor by comparison is of no consequence because the lizard brain has no capacity for logical or rational thought. If the current trigger creates one gram of energy and the original event created one kilo of it, then one kilo and one gram is going to be vented. Or to put it more succinctly, it's rather like somebody trying to kill his next door neighbor because their TV was too loud. Those undischarged instincts of survival get triggered every so often about a bit of normal life. And those we call those triggered events, uh, triggered events flashbacks. And you could work systematically, somatically, by what the body feels. And you can definitely get a result by repeating the process over and again. So it feeds back to that lizard brain. But why go the long way around? Much easier to work directly in the lizard brain, like BWRT does, where the trauma pattern exists. So, Cornell, um, there is a body memory, but it's only a recreation. All memories are recreated. That's what I've, I was talking about just now. Memories are recreated by a series of patterns. The reptilian complex recognizes part of a, tra of a traumatic event and triggers that bit of the body that was active at the time. So, Helen, you're correct. The body doesn't keep the score. It's the lizard brain that keeps the score and triggers the part of the body because it's the part of the body that was being affected originally. Nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, whatever. Whatever you mean, fear, it creates the same thing in the body. It might be a feeling in the shoulders, in the arms, in the chest, in the gut. It might feel like a heart attack or cramp. I don't know. It could be any of those things. Uh, Haley. um... Body doesn't keep the score, lizard brain does. Yes, you're correct. When a trigger for an undischarged impulse occurs, the lizard brain sends a signal. Haley, you've understood that absolutely perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Uh, Lisa, um, logical, yeah, okay. Good. So are we all, can we all see what I'm getting at when I say that the body does not keep the score, the lizard brain keeps it and triggers the body? because I know that I'm actually in contradiction with a very famous person with a very high level of qualifications. But if you ever contacted me directly, I would put this straight forward to him as well. I don't have a problem with that because I believe it absolutely implicitly. And uh, it's beginning to be believed by a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists now. It's, uh, and I can't see any flaws in it. Of course, I, so that's my hypothesis, so perhaps I wouldn't. But it's why... We sometimes can't understand what's going on because we're searching in the wrong place. 
if we always look at what the reptilian complex or the lizard brain might be doing, we're going to find answers to questions. Um, uh, Adelina, yes, <laughs> essentially. I'm quite sure that he would be unimpressed. I'm not criticizing Bessel van der Kolk whatsoever. He's a brilliant man uh, uh, completely. I'm not. But what I'm saying is on this particular thing, I think he's wrong. <laughs> and I'd, I would argue with him personally. And uh, he's much cleverer than me. Uh, he is um, very highly qualified, of course. I think he might be a psychiatrist or something. I mean, I'm I'm a product of high school and that's it. Uh, so what right have I got? But nonetheless, it's what I believe. And I do say it's my hypothesis and my opinion. But I would argue that one with him. I've never, ever, ever believed in body memory, ever. Since I was first taught it when I was first training about body memory, I've always thought it was rubbish. And I've always worked at the idea that the brain triggers the part of the body, that the, the lizard brain recreates and it accesses a part of, it accesses what it was trying to do. It accesses the response. And so it triggers that part of the body. And it's when we see the memory pattern. So I don't know if you were, if you were traumatized by a burglar breaking into your house, you might be traumatized by watching a film about burglary or reading something in the paper. Um, or you might you might be triggered by somebody who looks like a burglar. It's how daft it sounds. So those are the sort of things because that reptilian complex, that lizard brain, all it does is remember patterns and it just responds to those patterns. Now, there's a destructive circular process in this lizard brain that you have to break out of if you're to find true freedom to succeed. If you really want to become the most successful person you can be, instead of following what you've been taught by parents and other authority teachers, and that includes me. What you believe is what you look for. What you look for is what you find, and what you find is what you believe. But if what you believe and therefore keep finding doesn't work very well for you, it's easy to break out of it. Become more childlike. This sounds ridiculous. But when something doesn't work for you, ask why, how? Challenge everything that just doesn't work for you. It's what I've done all the time. This is how BWO was created, BWRT was created. It's how Warrior Settlers and Nomads was created. It's how Symbiodynamics, if any of you have done that, was created. By me recognizing that part of the therapy I was doing that I'd been taught to do didn't work. Didn't work as well as I wanted to. Why does it work? How can I make it work? How will this work? Ask those of questions. Children ask those of questions in their innocence because they don't know that they're supposed to know. And so if you become more childlike and ask questions, all the things that don't work for you, you're much more likely to find success that works for you. So your first response is, uh, for anything, is based on whatever is already present in that lizard brain. Whatever you believe, you will want to be true because that's associated with survival. This is why I don't join in the argument that people want me to join in with current COVID and conspiracy theories. I've never used the term conspiracist, by the way, and I've never called anybody a name, and I've never mocked anybody, no matter what somebody else is saying at the moment, I never have, um, because they've got their opinion, which is different from mine, and it's okay, because what they believe, they want to be true, because it's survival, because if we are wrong, we are under threat. So I want to, I want what I believe to be true so that I feel safe. They want what they believe to be true. The only difference is I don't care if they don't believe what I believe, but they seem to care very much if I don't believe their things. Uh, and that is an old, a whole different ball game that I could get into, but I don't want to start getting into that particular stuff. But the important thing to recognize is that your reptilian brain, your lizard, your lizard brain, will keep doing the same thing in the same way all the time unless you ask it why. So if you truly believe an idea, you'll be more likely to discover that it's true than otherwise. And if you don't believe it, you'll be more likely to discover that it's wrong or fake than otherwise. And this question of belief, and we're not talking about expectation here, talking about straightforward belief, because you can challenge belief. You can say, is that really true? Uh, and if you can get underneath that and begin to recognize exactly what the lizard brain is doing, exactly what belief is doing and how the lizard brain is working, you can actually make great changes in your life. Now, manifestation, I said I was going to talk about, nothing mystical about it, and it works, I know manifestation works, but not in the way that people say it works. There's actually nothing mystical about it at all. Lots of people like to teach there is some kind of mystical, spiritual thing that happens with the collection of the universe delivering stuff to your front doorstep. <laughs> 
If you believe it, if you believe manifestation, your brain will ensure that you do stuff. You know stuff means that or anything. You'll do something to make it work. You won't ne really necessarily be aware of that. If you don't believe it, your brain will make sure that you don't do anything to make it work. But you won't really be aware of that. So manifestation, many people believe that you only got to think about something, understand that you're worth it, know why you want it, all those things, and it will miraculously arrive on your doorstep. You know, you can think of, I would like an Aston Martin, um, I'd like it to be in black, I can smell the leather, I can hear the engine, I can see it, I can feel it, I deserve it, therefore it must happen. I can promise you it doesn't work because I tried it years ago. It doesn't work. I never did get an Aston Martin. <laughs> but there's a reason I didn't get an Aston Martin. I didn't actually do anything about trying to get one. Not really. Manifestation is important. You have to, the reason you have to know why you want it or why you're worth it is to the strength and the how it will happen part. Now, if you make it seem somehow related to survival, then the lizard brain will do everything to give you the idea of the action needed to make it happen. So it needs to be really important. It's got a really strong emotional thing so that you're, your very survival depends on it, and then it might happen, still won't just drop in your lap, because you still have to do something to make it work. Now, the best evidence that I can give you of this importance of having to do something was with symbiodynamics. I had an idea how to make it work, uh, and it, I did get reasonably successful. It wasn't quite where I wanted it. BWRT, I did something different. I spent two years before I taught BWRT, as you know. And long before anybody knew it, I just wrote down every single thing. I wanted it to be, I knew what it could do. I wanted it to become successful. I wanted to be able to teach it without getting laughed at. I knew I'd get laughed at, first of all. I wanted to get through all that. And I wrote down every single facet of it that came to me. I wrote down probably, I don't know, 10 times more than I actually ended up writing up. Because the brain, that, that lizard complex, that lizard brain, it will give you, 101 pieces of information where only one of them is important. It will give you every single thing, last thing that's connected to whatever you're trying to achieve. So if you've got something in your mind you want to achieve and you really want to achieve it, and you do the four sense test, all the rest of it, then provided you do something else, which is to write down every idea, whether you think it's associated or not, that your lizard brain gives you, then there's a very, very high likelihood that you will, in fact, find exactly what it is that you're trying to manifest so it's nothing spiritual or magical about it it's purely and simply that the brain has you doing something to do it so with bwrt it had me searching in some very odd websites that i couldn't understand having to translate bits of latin uh, to get a good fit all stuff that i don't even remember because it turned out i didn't need much of it but i kept writing stuff down and look what happened to it bwrt happened so it's really just by whatever you want. If I wanted, if I seriously wanted an Aston Martin, no, I don't doubt that I could find a way of getting one. Well, I probably could, but I, these days I haven't got many material wishes. But it's the important thing is that you can't just say, okay, I've done the four senses test. I've seen it, smelt it, heard it, tasted it, <laughs> all the rest of it. Sit back and wait for it to arrive at such a house. That won't happen. You have to do stuff. Does that make sense to everybody? I, that's me asking a question. So I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away with some of these things, but I do find them fascinating. And I know because I've worked this with a lot of people and helped a lot of people to get exactly what they want. Now, here's the thing. Success. Good. Okay, thank you, Georgina. Success. You have to know what success means to you. It has to really fire you up more than anything else. It's no good denying it, but you don't have to tell anybody about it. This is a game from the lizard brain. If you deny what you're really after, the lizard brain can't help you find it because you're turning it all the time, no, that's not it. Now, for many people, money is a marker of success. And that's okay. If, if money turns you on, then there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but money never did do much for me, even when I didn't have it. I, I, I've been at both ends. I've been comfortably off, which I am these days, largely through hard work. But I've also been many, many, many thousands of pounds in debt. I've been in both places. and. Uh, having enough money not to worry is better but money was never a huge importance to me recognition was and it was only when i finally stopped fretting about what people would think of me um if they knew that recognition was what i wanted to be recognized as being worthy of something that's when i started finding success because 
that's what I wanted. Yeah, Sumida, that's the important thing. Uh, you know, it's what works for us. If, if success for you is being adored or being adulated or being praised, then no, that's what you're after. I, I wasn't after that. I, it's recognition. So my reptilian complex, my lizard brain, does everything to help me find the recognition. And it's done a pretty good job of it. I'm not finished yet because the recognition I want to come from different places, but that's another story. So you have to know exactly what success means to you. It's got to really fire you up more than anything else. And you have to admit what it is. It doesn't matter if you think other people would think you're egotistical. So what? If other people thought you were depressive, so what? If other people thought you're materialistic, so what? It doesn't matter because you don't choose that and you cannot change that. If by nature you are egotistical, you can't change that. That's your ego. Use it for goodness sake. If by nature you're narcissistic, that is a bit of a problem. You still didn't choose it, but you can still use it. And, and I know one or two hugely successful narcissists. The difference is that they believe they're successful, whereas lots of other people don't really believe they're successful. <clears throat> so I'm going to move on to something slightly different now, actually. When, and what I was hoping to do with today's talk was to impress on all of you how simple that lizard brain is so that you can use it. It's not complicated. Do you ever want to think about the prefrontal lobes or the ever anterior, whatever cortex? I don't, I'm not bothered about any of those myself. You haven't got to think about that. All you want to think about is the base, base result. What that reptilian complex wants is for you to be successful in, and survive all the success. So when people say, um, my life depends on it, it doesn't necessarily, but they might say a relationship that life depends on, but life as they know it. This is why when a relationship breaks for some people, they feel like they might die because the reptilian complex is saying life as you know it is now over. And, you know, there are certain words. I talked about this on another course, certain words that trigger people. If I say the end, you've all felt a reaction to that. You cannot not because it's got so many connotations. The end. It's not the end of this talk yet. <clears throat> anyway, moving on to. The collective unconscious, which is part of the reptilian or the complex, this is the brain, and I'm sure that it's what um, Jung meant when he talked about the collective unconscious. It wasn't a spiritual thing at all. Unconscious expectation. Now, this is an interesting thing. I, I do teach this in detail on one of my courses, but in case you didn't do that course, we're born with an intrinsic subconscious knowledge evolved over millions of years of what life should be like. OK, a simple process of evolution. The more successfully animals raise their young, the more dominant those genes will be. And this went on for millions and millions of years. So the more successfully animals raise their young, the more dominant those genes will be. But modern life humans cannot in any way follow those patterns that still exist. And those patterns are ancient. Those patterns of how a child's, child's life should be and how our parenting should be, they go back 650 million years, 550 at least, into our earliest ancestors. They go back that far. Humans have been around, Homo sapiens sapiens has been around two and a half million years about, and it's only Homo, Homo sapiens sapiens that has the theory of mind, that is the awareness of what other people are thinking, the logical awareness that gets in the way of everything. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute because it's another hobby horse of mine. I'll, I'll come to it in a minute. So modern life cannot possibly in any way follow those patterns that still exist. And that means that most of us grow up with a subconscious expectation of something that we don't get. So most people can find dissatisfaction very easily. It gets attached to anything that they can attach it to. Um, some people grow up in an extremely disciplined environment where they're made to do stuff all the time. Now, some people get over that very quickly. Other people don't. Some people, when they get older, will rebel against any form of authority. So somebody says, wear a mask. I say, fuck you, I'm not going to. Still, I use the language. <laughs> I'm not going to. And it's just, they're not choosing that. That is something which is visited upon them. They uh, may be stronger and tougher than we are, those of us that comply with it. I was made to do all sorts of nonsensical things, but I managed to get past all that. And so when somebody said to me, wear a mask and you've got less chance of catching or passing on, I go, okay, on goes the mask if I go anywhere. But not that I go anywhere. So the collective unconscious, uh, we're born with that intrinsic knowledge, which has evolved over millions of years. But unfortunately, our parents cannot possibly follow those patterns. It's totally impossible. 
And there's another thing which is sort of um, connected with that as well, which is ancestral influence, epigenetic transmission. Now, this is a field which is very vague, and some people don't believe it at all. And the thing that interests me, and I know it interests in media because I had a short conversation about it as well, why some people feel unlovable no matter what therapy they have and no matter what relationship they have. People can have a relationship, they can have a partner that loves them fiercely, but they still don't feel lovable. And it doesn't matter how much therapy we do with them, we don't seem to be able to shift that feeling of unlovability. Now, that might be the result of cumulative trauma on the parents' loss of relationship. Almost everybody's experienced the great loss in a relationship. It's probably the worst pain you can experience. Everybody's had it. Anybody, every normal's had it anyway. And if it has affected somebody just before they were pregnant or within that sort of period, leading to them feeling unloved because they've been rejected, nobody really understands exactly how the process works, but it appears to be transmissible to progeny via their DNA. Now, Jacek Krostofiak, who some of you might know, um, he wrote a paper about BWRT, and he said that BWRT appears to have the capacity to suspend or inhibit the passing on of um, epigenetic trauma via DNA. It's a field that hasn't been researched very much, and I haven't got a great deal more on it. I did start to write an epigenetic um, protocol, but I discovered we already got it, in fact. So that's all I've got on ancestral influence and why some people just, they just can't get the feeling of being lovable. And it might well be because they've inherited through the DNA the feeling of having been rejected via their mother. Does that make so psychic ability and the world of the spirit. I'm not going to talk a lot about this because it's, it's fascinating. I could spend an hour on this one. But you know, people say, people are polarized here. People like Richard Dawkins say it doesn't exist, it's nonsense. And there are other people that say, of course it exists, I've experienced it. But what if it works if you truly believe it? If you truly believe it, what you believe is what you look for, and what you look for is what you find. So when you test it, if it's confirming you do not believe it, so it won't work. Okay, if you truly believe in it, you'll search for evidence of it and you'll find it. And maybe you're, and you're absolutely right, for you it works. If you don't believe it, it can't work because you can't possibly find the evidence because your brain isn't going to look that way. Your brain is going to look for the reasons. Yeah, Angela, yeah, I mean, this is, um, I, I, Anne Marie, I know we've had conversations about it before. I am a firm believer in there is something that we have absolutely no logical understanding of whatsoever. Absolutely nothing at all. We, we just don't understand it because we get connections for people that we not even met before. I, I do it online frequently and it, I don't conjure it up. I don't try to find it. It just happens. And nearly always when I do these things, the, whoever I'm talking to is exactly the same thing. And it's totally fascinating. Uh, I, do you know, Mary, I don't think it's to do with quantum physics. I've got a rather crazy hypothesis about it. I think that many, many years ago when the lizard brain was around and the early animals that had only the lizard brain, didn't have speech, but they might have had communication. Some of you will know that animals communicate with each other and animals they might communicate verbally. There are many, many, many evidences of animals knowing when their owner is coming home or whatever. One of our dogs always knows if Julie was out shopping, which she hasn't done much these days. He always knows long before she gets home. So what if... The reptilian complex is perfectly capable of making a connection, but consciousness, logic, and science has stopped it working. Who can, who can subscribe to that idea? That the reptilian complex has, uh, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely right, the Ultimate Media as well. But who can, yeah, so the reptilian complex knows about connection. I've taught this before. The reptilian complex, the lizard brain, knows how to communicate without such clumsiness as words and so on. It knows all about that. But logic, science, and a physical awareness, awareness of self, and awareness of the essence of self, uh, and awareness of other people, has overridden it. We can't use it anymore. But children who do not have anything like the sense of awareness often exhibit psychic abilities, or whatever we call psychic abilities. They, they exhibit it over and again, up until the age of about four. And at the age of about four or five is when the brain is fully formed, logic starts to take over and they're told that you can't know things you haven't seen and so on. But children before that age, uh, yeah, absolutely right, Lisa, because 
nearly everybody is conditioned to believing that any so-called, and they use so-called, I'm using it because people use it, so-called psychic work <clears throat> is necessarily false and ridiculous. Well, I don't know what it is. All I know is that on occasions, I experience it quite strongly in all sorts of things. Um, I seem to have lost something which I'm really pleased about on, over the last year. I used to have something called Death Messenger. I always knew two or three days beforehand when somebody was going to die. I couldn't put a name to it, but I don't have it now. I seem to have lost it. Or the last couple of times I've thought I've had it, it's been fake, it's been false. So I'm rather pleased because it was totally unpleasant. Um, yeah, okay, Amanda, well, you'll know why I'm pleased that I've lost it. Um, yeah, oh, okay, Lisa, well, I'm glad some of you have had that because it's totally unpleasant. I, I didn't want it, I don't like it, and I appear to have lost it. Um, oh, okay, Simida, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I didn't want it. It served no useful purpose because it wouldn't stop anybody dying. It just gave me the feelings that other people were suffering. I used to catch the upset and the hurt and the pain of it all. Um, and I would have it for two or three days. Yes, the end feeling. And some of you, those of you that experienced, you'll know this bit as well. There would be a sudden, there would be a, a sensation of wailing and crying and weeping and distress. And then after a little while, there'd be a surge of joy. Did anybody find that as well? A sudden lift, a joyful lift. I don't know if that, perhaps that's just me, but I always experienced it that way. Yeah. And it's as if they're, they're, they're so good. It's not just me then. Okay. I don't think so, Akila. Um, I, I don't know what it is. It's, I, it is some form of psychic awareness, which I seem to have lost, and I'm rather pleased to have lost it. I've got other things that go on which are more useful to me. <clears throat> now, I'm going to finish with something today. Um, this has got very little to do. It's got a bit to do with lizard brain, but not a lot to do with lizard brain. But this is really all about, I'm going to show you an exercise. Some of you have done it before. It won't hurt to do it again. This is all about being able to find a way of get, getting rid of stress and as quickly as you can. <clears throat> Nothing to do with relaxation. If you carry stress for too long, your cortisol will rise and your telomeres will shorten. And that's why that shortens stress shortens life because your telomeres means your cells can't regenerate properly. I haven't got time to go into all of that. But this exercise is a great one you can do. The, the lizard brain has all the neural pathways from when you were young and were much more carefree and less stressed. Those, those pathways are there. As you will know, the lizard brain doesn't lose anything. It's always still there. So they can be reactivated, but you have to keep on doing it to get the best out of it. So I'm going to go through this exercise. I've done it on several classes, so it may be familiar to you. It doesn't hurt to do it again. Once learned, you can do it whenever you want to, to inspire yourself and get yourself out of any doldrums, an old word. First thing, and you can do this in your brain after you've done it physically. Stand, if you can do this now, without getting laughed at, stand up like an energetic person, if you can. Imagine for a moment how an energetic person might feel as they stand up straight backed or full of anticipation of some exciting event or another. So now just do that. Stand up, stand up straight as if you were younger and full of excitement and anticipation. You all remember the feeling. I'm 79 now and I can remember the feeling still from 20. Excitation. Move like an able-bodied person. If you can, move like somebody who is naturally agile and able to do it so well they will surprise the hell out of people that know them. If you take only a few steps, it will re-energize those disused pathways. You'll feel them coming back into life again. And finally, talk like an enthusiastic person. If, you, if, you're on, if you're with somebody in the room, talk to them with great enthusiasm about what we're talking about today. If not, talk to me on the screen. Terence, I think this has been fantastic. Nothing like him singing my own praises, is there? Terence, I feel fantastic. A frequent problem aging or poor self-worth is the belief that others are not interested in what you have to say. And so there's very little point in showing enthusiasm. It's almost like talking to yourself. But that lack of vitality or expression in speech tends to make others less interested. So if I was to say this bit in a different tone, frequent problem of aging or poor self-worth is the belief that others are not interested in what you have to say. So there's little point in showing enthusiasm. <laughs> the words are the same and the ideas are the same. It doesn't carry anything, does it? The lack of vitality or expression in the speech tends to make others less interested. 
therefore confirming the negative belief, and it becomes self-perpetuating. So describe something that happened one time as vividly and as enthusiastically as you can, just as if it was really important. And notice how that feels. So you can do that exercise in your brain. Now, if, if you've done it physically, you can sit down again and imagine it. Imagine standing like an energetic person. You can feel the nerves, the neural pathways activating because I can as I'm talking about it. Move like an able-bodied person. Imagine, I can still do that. My knees don't let me these days, but I can imagine when I was a ballroom dancer, ballroom jai, pasadobi, samba, and so on. I can remember still the exact feeling of movement, of being able to glide like I was on a skateboard. I can't do that now, but I can remember it so well. The brain remembers it. And talk like an enthusiastic person. Well, I certainly don't have any trouble with that, of course. Okay, that's about where I wanted to get to today.